Are you ready for the word? Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to go ahead and do a little prefix on this message. For those of you that are young in your walk with God, you may have some difficulty grasping this message tonight for yourself. But trust me, it will work. Everybody say, I'm blessed according to the word in Jesus' name. Amen. What I've been teaching on Wednesday night is a prefix to what I'm going to be doing on Wednesday night after the first of the year. We're going to advertise in the community, let the people know that Wednesday night is a time to find healing for your body, your spirit, and your soul. Now your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And some people have a problem with their emotions. Some people have a problem, period. We're going to believe God for healing, amen? Amen. My message tonight, the caretaker and the name of Jesus. Turn to me in your Bible to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans is so good you just read the whole thing, you know. Verse 10. No, verse 8. Verse 8. But what does it say? The Word, the Word of God, is near you. A better translation for the word near is easy. Easy. The word of God is easy in you. It's not hard. You know where the hardship comes? In your head. Mm Mm-hmm. When you get down into the spirit, things change. This is why when you're listening to God, you don't listen in your head, you listen in your heart. Amen? Amen. But what does it say? The word of God is near, easy in you, in your mouth, in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, proclaim, and declare. That if you confess with your mouth, Yahweh, Jehovah saves, Jesus and believe in your heart, spirit, that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You shall be sozo. The word sozo means made completely whole, spirit, soul, and body. Completely delivered. When God quote, saved you, unquote. He delivered you in that moment completely. When I walked into the church where I got saved on that Sunday morning, I walked in there with a bleeding digestive system that the doctors could not cure or fix or stop. He had told me three months earlier, you've got about three months left. And that morning, Jesus came into my life. And I walked out of that church never to bleed again. Are you listening to me? I'm here to tell you something. I believe what I'm saying because I've been there and done that. You understand what I'm saying? And if you have not had any kind of experience with God in the sense of physical healing, spiritual healing, emotional healing, some of these things you're struggling with, well, I don't know if I can, you know, whatever. I want you today to confess with me, Jesus is 
Abel. Amen? All right, so we look at verse 10. For the, with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, everybody say mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I want to go back to verse 9 and point out something. If you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, Yahweh, Jehovah saves, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be completely delivered, spirit, soul, and body. Do you believe? I like that. <laughs> That's like the preacher that was baptizing this boy. And he was kind of doing a different way of baptizing from what we would do. He took him down and brought him up out of the water and said, Do you believe? He said, Believe what? The preacher took him down again, brought him up and said, Do you believe? He said, Believe what? He took him down again and said, do you believe now? He said, I believe you're trying to drown me. <laughs> and sometimes we try to, we can overwhelm people. And my job tonight, I would, I'm trying to make it as easy as possible, but I realize some of the things I say tonight can be a little overwhelming, especially if this is a new walk for you, okay? But I want you to understand, if you believe that, you know, here I go, are you ready? Do you believe that Jesus stayed in the grave and rotted? No. Do you believe that the disciples came in the late hours of the night and stole his body? No. Why not? All right, let me ask you this. Do you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Prove it. Prove it. Boy, I got everybody preaching tonight, hadn't I? Ah, I love it. I'm looking around the room at all the proof that Jesus rules and reigns. Amen? Give the Lord a shout and give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Looking at your outline in the introduction, just as we confess our faith in Jesus as a person, as the Son of God, as Lord, and as Savior, and you could probably be keep on because I can think of 52 powerful names that describe the characteristics of Jesus. But if we confess our faith in Jesus, we should also confess our faith in the name of Jesus, for Jesus and his name is one and the same. Mm -mm -mm. Now, so when I say Jesus, is that his name? Yeah. I like you, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. In what language? Is it one place to look at it? Uh, we had a sound man here whose name is, in English, is spelled Jesus. In Spanish, it's pronounced Jesus. And it really bothered me. I just aggravated him. He goes, hey, Jesus, you need to turn me up. He goes, don't call me that. <laughs> oh, boy. What is his name, preacher? What do you need? You need a healer? That's his name. You need a friend? That's his name. You need a brother? That's his name. You need a mother-in-law? <laughs> now I threw that in there for one reason. There are some things that just does not fit the nature of Jesus, right? Not necessarily a mother-in-law. I, I had a great mother-in-law. She was a sweetie. She was my children's pastor for years. Wonderful person. Oh, and she gave me my wife, too. Huh. 
It couldn't be too bad, right? Looking at the introduction again, we confess with our mouth what we believe in our heart. Some people say, I don't believe in that confession business. I had to deal with that myself at one point in time. But, all the while, they're already doing it daily, that is, talking and confessing what they believe about anything and everything. Well, I believe, you know, what do you, they're already starting to confess. You know, I have people come up to me and say, you teen challenge guys are really bad at this. I come over and teach class on a Tuesday morning, and I come up to hug you, and you, you put your hand up like this and say, you don't want to get near me, preacher, you'll get what I've got. Brothers, if you get near me, you're going to get what I've got. Right. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I'm serious. You need to start changing your way of thinking, the way of talking, what you're confessing. Man, I had a hard time getting to church tonight. I didn't. I was coming down the road, and I saw what was going on up there, and I thought, you know what? I need another plan. My wife said, why don't you turn there? I said, nope. Next street, she said, you're not going to turn there? I said, nope. And I turned at the next street, and when we got to the traffic light, we looked at all the other avenues. I got to come in. There was a long line of cars, that way, that way, that way. And me, I'm two cars from the traffic light waiting for the light to change. Hello. You can't lose with Jesus. You know what I'm talking about? I was taking, a, uh, when I was a youth pastor, I had taken uh, our youth to a youth rally in another city, and we were coming back late at night. My car's loaded. Come on in, I'm waiting on you. I see you. You know, if you stay out there too long, I'll make you play drums. <laughs> Amen. And I had a carload of kids, you know, just as many kids as you could possibly get in that car, <clears throat> and they're all asleep. I'm tired and cranky and driving. No, I wasn't cranky. I was spiritual. When you've been up with a bunch of teenagers all day long, you're really spiritual. Yeah. Mm, thank you. And, you know, two of the kids in the front seat had somehow or another slid down on the floor and had their head resting in the seat and everything. And I think, man, I'm almost to the church. And I come up to this traffic light, what they call Navy Boulevard. And the Brownsville Church is just around the corner there. I'm almost there. And I'm coming up on that traffic light. Man, I'm, I'm just three or four minutes from the church. And for some reason, instead of going through the traffic light, I took the exit. And I was angry with myself until I realized that the people in that lane went through that traffic light and didn't stop. And if I had kept going, I would have gone right into them. And, and then I was able to back up and say, thank you, Jesus. And I had to repent over my attitude. You understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. All right. Now, go a little bit further with me. There is no salvation without confession and no remission of sin without confession. Now, I want to get something plain with you. For the most of us, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and had someone lead you through a sinner's prayer. They said something like this about confessing your sins. Now, I believe in confessing your sins. I believe in that. But that will not save you. Hello? I can confess my sins all day long, and that will not save me. What saves me is when I begin to confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. What heals me is when I begin to confess Jesus as my healer. What meets my need is when I begin to confess Jesus as my provider. Watch your confession. You have what you say, good or bad. 
Another scripture says you're going to reap what you sow. Let me tell you this. If you reap apples, you do not get oranges. You get apples. If you sow good stuff, you're going to reap good stuff. If you sow negative stuff, you're going to reap negative stuff. This is the time for everybody to get a wild day going. Amen? Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, wow, God is good. Amen. Turn to me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. My first point tonight, you are the caretaker of your body. We're going to be spending some time after the first of the year believing God to heal people, spirit, soul, and body. But tonight I want you to focus on this, that you're the caretaker of your body, which means that you are the caretaker of the house of God. Your body is the temple of God, and you are the caretaker of God's house. Now, have you taken care of God's house today? Oh, boy. We need to think about it. Some of us have done a good job. Some of us ran the vacuum cleaner. Some of us ran the dust. <laughs> Uh, some of us eh, made a mess in the house. Oh, boy. Looking at your outline, well, let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. Paul says something that really messes my mind up. He says, But I disciplined my body and bring it into subjection lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Ooh. Now, a lot of you are already backing up. No, it's time to pull out the stops and run forward. I know, I know, I know everybody in this room is well disciplined. I know that you have a disciplined mind, and spirit, you have discipline in your emotions, you have everything under control. <laughs> My wife said, under construction. <laughs> now I'm gonna say something in a minute, I wanna go ahead and say it now, but I'll say it again a little different way. How many of you know that you're in a partnership with Jesus? Wow, <laughs> I just got it. <laughs> you're in a partnership with Jesus. I had a man come to me one time years ago. He, was, he liked the work that I was doing at that time. He offered me a partnership. He said, I've got the money, and you've got the ability. I'll foot the bill if you'll take the responsibility. And I almost did it, but, you know, something else came along that really got my attention, and I didn't go that way. But I could have had a partnership at that time with him providing everything I needed to do what I enjoyed doing. How many of you love serving the Lord? Amen. How many of you know you're in a partnership with God? Amen. How many of you know that He will pay the bills, He can supply all you need so that you can enjoy what you're doing? Amen. You're the caretaker of His house. And that's where we start. Present your body as a living sacrifice. I'll come back to that. Holy and acceptable unto God as an act of worship. Look at your outline with me. And I mentioned this to my brother a moment ago. Letter A under point one, number one, note. Parents are the caretaker of small children until they learn how to care for themselves. The parent continues to offer help in caring for the physical well-being of their children. 
This is also the action of our Heavenly Father. When I first got saved, I'm a babe in Christ. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to start. And so I asked one of the men in the church, I said, I, I, said, I need to read a Bible. Where can I get one? He got me a Bible. And I found out it was just like the one that my mother had hid in my trunk when I went off to college. It was the Billy Graham Bible. I had a bit, and I think I've still got it in my footlocker from college. A Billy Graham Bible. When I saw that Billy Graham Bible in college, I didn't want anything to do with it. And I wound up being a prayer counselor for a Billy Graham crusade years later. Hello. This is the way God works. And so you start out with small beginnings. You don't know what you're doing half the time. And you get frustrated. And you, you feel like God didn't hear my prayer and all this kind of thing. Relax. Daddy's going to take care of you. The expression in the Bible is Abba, Father. Literal translation of Abba is good daddy. Now some of us had good daddies bringing us up. Some of us didn't have a daddy at all. But God will put people in your life to make up the difference. And when you begin experiencing these things, you see how God is working. All of a sudden, you'll find that God will put somebody in your path that's going through what you went through. And at that time, you can begin to minister to them from your own personal relationship with God. And this is why it's so important that you be the caretaker of your body. Are you still listening to me? Yes. Am I doing okay? Yep. Yes. All right. Going back to your notes. Let it be, you are to rule over your body. Paul said, I keep my body under subjection. Romans 12.1 tells us that by the mercies of God, we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, pardon me, holy and acceptable unto God. The word holy got left out. Holy and acceptable unto God as a reasonable act of worship. How many of you want to worship God? You've got to have a sacrifice. But Jesus is my sacrifice. Jesus is your sacrifice for your spiritual well-being. You have to have a sacrifice for your physical well-being, as well as your mental well-being. And that sacrifice is you. And you know what I don't like? I don't like dying out to self. Do you? I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it the way I want to do it. And God says no. God said, you're the caretaker of my house. And this is the way I want to run the house. Hello? I was 14 years old. And the owner of a restaurant hired me, thinking I was 16 years old. And secretary called me in and asked for my social security card. Back then, you didn't get a social security card until you was 16. And I said, I don't have one. She said, why not? I said, well, I'm not old enough. She said, well, how old are you, son? I said, I'm 14. She said, uh-oh, you can't work here. So she goes and tells the boss, she, he hired a 14-year-old kid out there. Boss <coughs> calls me in the office. He said, son, if you'll keep your mouth shut, 
Do I need to say that again? We need to learn to shut up. We have a lot of opinion, don't we? We have opinion about the Democrat and the Republicans, and we have an opinion about Congress, and we have an opinion about the President, and we have an opinion about the preacher's sermon. Uh. <laughs> we have an opinion about praise and worship. We have an opinion about our brothers and sisters in Christ. Hello. Shh. Hush. He said, you can keep your mouth shut. I'll pay you under the table until you're 16. Do you know why he kept me? <laughs> she said, because you kept your mouth shut. There was a lot of aluminum uh, ornament decoration on the building outside. And it oxidizes, tarnishes. And you clean it with ammonia. He said, son, you're the only person that I put out there on that job that actually made it look good. He said, you do a good job. There's no streets. And then he raised my pay. <laughs> Hello. It's all about the money, right? In America has two gods. And I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about sensuality and money. How many times did that bring Israel to her knees? So I'm asking you tonight. Be the caretaker that God called you to be. Spiritual ammonia called the blood of Jesus Christ would clean up all the streets. You still with me? All right, now, looking at your notes again. Letter D under point one. As caretaker, we can free our body from every physical and spiritual affliction by and through the name of Jesus. I want to say that again. You can free yourself. I had an addiction from the time I was in high school until I got saved. It almost killed me. It almost killed me. And I freed myself from that addiction. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. I thought you said you got saved and Jesus delivered you. Yes. You know how I got saved? I confessed Jesus Christ as Lord of my life. I surrendered my life to him. And I said, God, if you can get anything out of this fellow, it's all yours. God said, great, but I want you to be the caretaker. Did you give me my life? Did you give your life to Jesus? Yes. Really? Yes. Did you give your life to Jesus? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Completely. Absolutely. You didn't take any part of it back every once in a while. Uh, ah. yeah. You understand I'm messing with you. But the point I want you to get is this. Every single one of us surrendered our heart and life to Jesus, and Jesus turned right around and made you the caretaker. And for some of us, that's kind of like what they had to do up there with the PowerPoint and the new computer and everything. They had to get the book out to see how to make this thing run. Here's the manual on how to make things run. Amen? Amen? Don't slight yourself on this thing right here. I do my studying for sermons. I do my studying for my personal benefit. 
And then, just for leisure, I read the entire Bible through every year. Hello. I hate the book of Leviticus. Uh, I really used to really hate the book of Leviticus. He begat, they begat. I could care less about all those begats. And one day God said, go look up the meaning of those names. And every one of those sections where it says, and just like in, in Luke's gospel and uh, Matthew's gospel, it gives the lineage 14 generations of Jesus' uh, parents, uh, Mary and Joseph. Each one of those names tell you something about the plan of salvation. Hello. My goddaughter, God granddaughter, has a boyfriend. They've been dating for three months. My wife and I had Thanksgiving dinner with my godson and his family. And his daughter had her boyfriend there, along with his three brothers and mom and daddy. I have never in my life seen one family with four boys and all four of them so stinking good looking. It's just a sin, you know what I mean? <laughs> but not only were all four of them outstanding in their looks, they were outstanding in their character. All saved, love God, polite, mannered. I told the mom and dad later, I said, you know, it's, you've done a remarkable job with your family. I was just overwhelmed. But I took my god-granddaughter and her boyfriend over in the corner. And I said, son, if you're still here six months from now, you're going to have to talk to me. He looked at her and he looked at me. He didn't know what to say. Mm. How many of you know you have a godfather? I know you call him Father God, but he's Godfather. Amen. He's going to call you in and say, hey, look, this is my house. You better take care of it. If you don't take care of it, you're going to have to deal with me. Relax. <laughs> Are you listening to me? I want you to recognize that if, how many of you already know, you know you're not junk. Amen. God never made junk, right? We had a conversation earlier today that even the birds of the uh, air and the beasts of the field, the rocks and the rain, the trees, all that, it's all good stuff. The only negative things you can find in this world is you're going to have to blame it on Eve. No, you can't blame it on Eve. No, it's not. Somebody said it's the woman's fault. No, it's not the woman's fault. It's the man's fault. Adam was supposed to take care of everything, including Eve. He wasn't paying attention. He'd probably be fishing. I don't know what he was doing. But some of you daddies need to pay attention. Some of you husbands need to pay attention. We'll leave it at that. I'm, I'm in trouble already, okay? All right, point two, your body belongs to God. It is his temple, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, 
both of which is God. Now, that uh, which is God, it's not just ownership there. The, the uh, Greek translation would lend it to partnership. This is God's house. And God's going to let you live in it. And I'm sassing my mother one day. I know you never did that. She said, son, as long as you are in my house, you're going to do what I say. As long as you put your feet under my table, you're going to obey my rules. That's God's house. And as long as you live in that house, you're going to have to do it His work. Hello? And if you don't, I love you, brother. He's going to whale the tar out of you. <laughs> oh, boy. No, there's a price to pay for rebellion. There's a price to pay for disobedience. What I'm trying to tell you tonight is this. Folk, get ready to be used of God. And to be ready, it's just like a football player. Football season is coming up. Before the school starts having classes, they've got those kids out there at the crack of dawn getting them ready for football season. And they're out there in the evening into dark getting ready for football season. I want you to know God's about to get us ready for a Holy Ghost revival, signs, wonders, and miracles. And we need to be taking better care of the house, the spirit, and the mind. That is called sozo salvation. All right, now, uh, point two, letter A, as a new creature in Christ, you and Father God are one in union and in this relationship. Now, um, Courtney, you're my best guinea pig, so come over here and help me out a little bit. He usually does what I tell him to do without any static, you know. Do what I do. That's not what I did. Do what I did. Is that what I did? Was it, was it, it, was, it was? They said you did exactly what I did, okay? All right, what is God doing right now with you? Go sit down. <laughs> How many of you are acting like God? I'm telling you, man. How many of you are talking just like God? How many of you are experiencing things just like God? You know, I realize that that's not where we are, okay? Come here. Stand right there. When I walk through the storm, he walks with me. Do I want him to follow me through the storm, or do I want to follow him through the storm? Hello? Amen. Okay, now you're God. You make the next move. How do you feel? <laughs> you know, I just imagine God laughs at us, too. Go sit down. <laughs> J. 
Jesus said, the things that I do, you do also. Jesus said, go into all the world, every social order, preach, proclaim, and declare good news, my word. And I will confirm my word with signs and wonders. How many of you are going? How many of you are on the go? How many of you promised God you would go? I wonder if it's true around the world that about 50% of God's people are committed. Oh boy, I'll leave that one alone. You didn't get it. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, now I'm going to do something interesting here. Number two, your body belongs to God. It is his temple. Letter B. There's two passages of scripture I want you to look at. Let's look at John 16 first. John 16, verse 23 and 24. Jesus is talking, and I tell you, this, this, these several chapters of John 14, 15, 16, and 17 is powerful. You need to study it and study it and study it. In verse 23... Jesus said, in that day, talking about you and me, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. So ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full or complete. Or fruitful. Now, go over to chapter 14 and look with me at verse 13 and 14. You there? Verse 13. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Does that sound like a repeat of chapter 16? Yes. But it's not. I want to walk you through it. Looking at your outline with me on the point, point two. Letter B. According to John 16... You are not demanding anything of God when you use the name of Jesus. You're exercising your spiritual authority in that name for the glory of God, usually it's against demonic forces. But here's my thing. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Uh, We pray something like this. Father, bless this food in Jesus' name. Amen. That's absolutely worthless. Well, don't you believe in praying over your food? Absolutely, yes. But try it this way. Father, you do it your own way, but, you know, something like this. You have blessed me abundantly. And I sit here before this powerfully wonderful meal my wife has prepared. And I am about to indulge for your glory. And some of you didn't get that. What have you done today for the glory of God? Some people get in the car to go on a trip and they say, let's pray for safety now. Are your steps ordered of the Lord? When I get in the car, I don't pray for safety. I say, God, you know where I'm going, what I'm supposed to do? Get glory out of it. Hello? Change your way of thinking. The name of Jesus is not a formula. 
the name of Jesus is not something you tag on to the end of the prayer. Jesus is talking about two different situations here about using the name of Jesus. In this scripture, he's talking about using the name of Jesus for the glory of God. I am here for your glory. Lord, I'm stretching forth my hand to minister for your glory. Let everything, Jesus said, look, when you're talking to your heavenly father, when you're talking to Abba Daddy, use my name. It'll get you in. It'll get you in. You understand what I'm saying? You want to get in the presence of God? Say, Jesus. Hello? Oftentimes, when I'm ever in a guest study before church praying, I feel a presence of the Spirit for the service. If I don't, I'm just telling you what I do. I will say this. Jesus! 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 It may not work for you. It works for me. Oh, glory! Wow! Wow. You understand what I'm doing now? And I feel his presence because the Father has put the name of Jesus above every name and every power and every entity in existence. And you have the power of eternity. I hope you got that. I, I really, really want you to get that. I mean, when you say Jesus, devil tremble. When you walk in the room, the devil leave. Because of who you are. You've got the power of attorney in your hand. Mm. Now, in John 14, look at that again, would you, John 14? Verse 13. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father be glorified in the Son. That is not talking about praying. Not talking about praying. It's talking about making a demand. Now watch this. In Acts chapter 3, you have the story of Peter and John going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, meeting the lame man. The lame man had been sitting there at the gate all of his life. This one day, after receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter looks at the man and said, silver and gold is not what I have. What I have, I'm going to give you. Now, I can assure you that Peter had something, a quarter or a nickel, he had something in his pocket. Because in his devout commitment to God, he was going to the temple at the hour of prayer. He had an offering. How many of you have an offering? Amen? It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean he didn't have a nickel in his pocket. It meant, this is, I have something. Silver and gold is not what I have. What I have, I'm about to give you. And I walk into Teen Challenge and they throw their arm up and say, you don't want to come near me and hug me. You'll get what I've got. I don't, I'm not going to get what you've got. You're going to get what I've got. Yeah. You're sick, hang out with me, you get well. Yeah. Yeah. I told you the other night, my wife and I got married in November. 150 years ago. (laughs) 
Right after the first of the year, she came down with the flu, cold or whatever. And I was some, somewhat caught off guard on that. And I said, what's going on here? And she said, oh, I do this every year. I said, we're going to put a stop to that. So we joined hands and we agreed that this would never happen again. We haven't had the cold or the flu since then. Now, cottonwood makes my nose run. I need to get deliverance from cottonwood. I have my other aches and pains, but cold and flu, we don't get it. You have the ability to be the caretaker of your body. What happened here is we have the ability to help somebody else be the caretaker of their body. And Peter said, it's not about, what I have is not silver and gold. What I have, I'm about to give you. And this, here's what he said. He said, he took him by the hand, yanked the, yank, yanked the lame man up, never walked, okay? And he said, get up and walk in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And the man didn't. He leaped. You understand what I've just said? What did Peter do? Peter made a demand, not of God. He made the demand on the man. I demand you in the name of Jesus, walk. Be healed. Be made whole. I'm commanding you in the name of Jesus. Folks, I'm commanding this church to have a revival in the name of Jesus. I have the power and authority to do it. And you can do that with your emotions, too. Amen. Point three. The responsibility of the caretaker. The responsibility of certain things have been placed in the hand of the believer. We present our body as a living sacrifice to God as an act of worship. Ephesians 4.24, you, what am I talking about? The responsibility of the caretaker. You put on the new man. You do that. You put him on. You put on the new man, which was created according to the likeness of God in righteousness and true holiness. Nobody can do that for you. Preacher can't do it for you. Mama can't do it for you. You have to do it for yourself. Put them on. Put on the robe of righteousness. Put on the character of Christ. Adam and Eve in the garden was clothed with God's glory. They messed up. The glory lifted. And they were naked. The nakedness there, whether it's talking about a naked body or not, I don't know. It could have been a naked body. It doesn't have to be a naked body. But apparently, from what happened next, they were the naked body. The flesh was covered with the glory. You couldn't see the flesh. If you looked at the man and the woman, you saw the glory. You didn't see the flesh. They lost the glory. God had to clothe them. He clothed them by killing an animal and taking the skin and putting it on them. That animal lost his life because he lost his blood. Which is a picture, a picture and a type of Jesus Christ becoming our sacrifice. And on the cross, he lost his blood. That you and I might receive the robe of righteousness. Now, what is the robe of righteousness? In all of my ministry, I've never heard a sermon on the robe of righteousness. 
Well, it's the righteousness of God in Christ. That's true. But I want you to know something. That's what Adam and Eve had on. The robe of righteousness is the glory of God. Christ the righteous is for the glory of God. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. His righteousness is the glory of God that's on you right now. And so when God looks down here on you, you know what he sees? He doesn't see you. He sees the glory. How do you see yourself? You and God are in partnership together. And you have to have a common vision. A fellow told me one time, he said, Preacher, you don't want to hang out with me, I'm bad. That was his confession. Have you confessed Jesus Christ as Lord of your life? as your Savior? Have you confessed Jesus Christ as your brother? Have you confessed Jesus Christ as your righteousness? Then I want you to know something. The glory that came down on Mount Sinai has come down on you. Stay in the glory cloud. Looking at your outline one more time, letter D, This is my responsibility as a caretaker. Submit yourself to God. My responsibility, resist the devil and he will flee from you. My responsibility, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And tonight I want somebody to take up their responsibility. How many of you take up your responsibility as a caretaker of God's house? Amen? Amen. How many of you take up the responsibility of doing what God called you to do? How many of you are ready to fulfill the Great Commission? Amen. What is the Great Commission? Go. Do something. Preach. Proclaim. Declare that people are free and you live the life so that they can look at you and say, I want to be just like you. And I look at him and say, no, you want to be just like Jesus. What you're seeing is not Jim. What you're seeing is Jesus. Amen? But Jesus and Jim are in a partnership. Have you heard of the J&J Corporation? He pays the bills and I do the work. Amen? <laughs> God bless you. Give the Lord a praise offering. Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. Lord, I want to be near you. Lord, I want to see your face. I want to be in your intimate mercy. Shout to all the people